The Wicked Will Rise, Chapter 4 The queendom of the wingless ones was built high in the trees, just below the thick canopy of leaves that covered the dark jungle. The monkeys had known the path through the jungle by heart and commanded enough respect in these woods that we'd been able to pass without being bothered by any of the creatures who shared it with them. But it had still taken us hours to make our way through the dense brush of vines and branches into the heart of the forest where they had their treetop home. We'd paused only once, for me to wash the blood off my body in a stream where we stopped in front of a big tree. I looked at Ollie. Why are we stopping? This is the human entrance. You can't very well climb up there like the others, can you? I looked up to where he was pointing. Most of the monkeys traveling with us simply scampered up into the branches. Ollie pressed his palm into a barely visible indentation in the trunk and a door slid open, revealing the tree had been outfitted with a makeshift contraption kind of like a dumbwaiter. Ollie crawled inside and beckoned for us to follow, and once we were in, he and Maud and I took turns pulling on the rope that turned the pulley and raised the platform carrying us up, up, up into the darkness. Ollie was completely out of breath, and I wasn't doing much better by the time we emerged from the passage onto a narrow platform. The monkey village was like the world's coolest treehouse, crossed in with something out of the Swiss Family Robinson theme party thrown by Martha Stewart. Throughout the village, wooden houses of all shapes and sizes had been built into the treetops, all of them connected by a network of suspended walkways constructed out of roughly hewn planks and twisted vines. Everywhere I looked were monkeys in human clothing. There are monkeys in sharp little three-piece suits, monkeys in sweatpants and t-shirts, monkeys in nurses' uniforms, and even monkeys in tiny little ball gowns who looked like they could be on their way to the monkey Oscars. Most of them weren't using the walkways. Instead, the ones with places to be were swinging from vines and scampering across branches, looking perfectly unaware of the fact that they were at least 500 feet up. We were greeted by a monkey who seemed not at all self-conscious about the fact that she was wearing a French maid's uniform. "'Welcome back,' she said to Ollie in a voice low, too low and gruff for her tiny size. She gave him a quick pat on the back and a kiss on the cheek before turning to the queen, sinking into a clumsy curtsy as I fought to stifle a giggle. "'Greetings, your majesty,' she said to Ozma. "'I'm Iris. We are honored to have you join us in our village.' After lingering on the queen for a few moments, Iris directed her attention to me. Her smile faded. I was starting to realize that these monkeys don't quite trust me. "'Hi,' I said awkwardly. "'I'm Amy.' "'Yes.' she said. Queen Lulu has been awaiting your arrival. Ali will take you to her while I escort her majesty to the quarters you'll be sharing. With that, Iris took the wide-eyed Ozma by the hand and led her away. I don't think your friends are that into me, I said to Ollie. He just shrugged. The wingless ones have a bad track record with witches. Before I could protest, he was already moving, scampering off across the rope bridge. I followed. Because the canopy blocked out almost any light from the sun, the village was lit instead by strange floating lanterns that looked like oversized translucent lemons. They hung in the air along the walkways and over the tree houses, their glowing light giving the otherwise dim village the feeling of a fancy garden party just about to start. Not that I've ever been to a fancy garden party, but back in Kansas I did sometimes used to watch HGTV with my mom, when we were getting along, I mean. Sunfruit, Ollie explained, seeing me staring at the lamp things that were made our way across the walkways. Try one. He plucked a fruit from where it hovered and expertly shucked a piece of soft, thin rind from the top, revealing a yellowish, glowing goop inside. He handed it to me. The sunfruit felt warm in my palm and had the rubbery consistency of a gummy bear. I was a little afraid of it, but I didn't want to offend him, so I stuck a finger in, scooped up some of the slime, and tasted it. I was expecting it to be kind of gross. I wasn't prepared for, for it to be pretty much the most delicious thing I've ever eaten. It tasted like ten things at once, like salt water, taffy, and pineapples, and fruity drinks, and with little umbrellas. It tasted like summer, and the last day of school on the beach. I closed my eyes and savored it for a second, suddenly realizing exactly how long it has been since the time to actually enjoy something. These days, distractions like that were pretty hard to come by. I could have spent the next hour trying to separate out all the flavors of the sunfruit, but Ollie was already tugging at my sleeve. We don't want to keep Queen Lulu waiting. She is a wise ruler, but she gets frustrated easily. You'd rather not see her when she's angry. 
I took his word for it, but I continued scooping out more of the sunfruit as we kept walking. A few minutes later, we came to a spiral of stairs that had been built into the outside of a thick th trunked tree. The queen will see you alone, Ollie said. When you're done, you can find her chamber your chambers near the waterfall. A waterfall? Up here in the trees? Can't miss it, he said, jumping from the path and grabbing onto a vine with his tail. He swung around and hung there upside down, looking at me in the eye. Thank you, Amy, he said, and I knew that he wasn't just thanking me for saving him or for saving his sister. Then he was gone into the leaves. I took a deep breath and began to make my way up the rickety wooden stairs that twisted up toward the canopy. I took each wobbly step carefully, hugging the tree as closely as I possibly could, trying not to think about the fact that I was probably the first fully grown human to use these paths in years. You'd think the day I just would have cure cured me of my fear of heights, but no. Look, fear's not always rational, okay? Anyway, there's a difference between being afraid and being a coward. At least there was one thing. I could make comfort in. If you're afraid, you must still be a little bit human. When I finally made it up through the canopy, I discovered that the palace wasn't really a palace at all. Just a large, round hut that sat in a spacious platform of planks above the trees. Inside, Queen Lulu was sitting on a large throne constructed out of sticks and branches in the middle of a filthy room strewn with banana peels, clothes, and piles upon piles of newspapers, books, toys, and other junk. She wore bright red lipstick a poofy pink tutu, and pink rhinestone-encrusted cat-eye sunglasses. She sat there eyeing me, all the while fanning herself with a paper fan. Well, 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 she squeaked from behind her fan. If it isn't famous, Amy Gum, welcome to my queendom. So she was no Kate Middleton. Still, I wasn't sure what to expect from her as I approached her throne, and I figured that even a queen in a tutu expects a certain amount of respect. I bowed. It's an honor to meet you, your highness, I said. Charmed, I'm sure, Queen Lulu said. Her voice was squeaky, but tough, too. I hear you're a hero type. The real deal. You and your daring rescues. Oh, sure, we've heard all about these around these parts. Uh, thanks, I said. I don't know, I was just doing what anyone would have done, I guess. Well, bless your heart, Lulu said. She set her fan aside and casually strapped, scratched her armpit. Shall we call our dead all settled up here, then? Dead? I asked. Yeah, dead. You saved Ollie and Maud. They saved you. Even Stephen. No more monkey business. Oh, I said, taken aback. I mean, okay. It wasn't like I was keeping track or anything. Queen Lulu lowered her glasses and looked out over them. Let's cut the crap, she said. You seem like a nice girl. But I want to make sure that we have things straight here. I allowed Ali and Ma to help you out this one little time. But we wingless ones aren't going to get involved in whatever nonsense is brewing in Oz these days. What Dorothy and the rest of them do down there? That's something else's ball of beeswax. We've got a good thing going up here in the trees. I folded my arms across my chest. Is that what you wanted to talk to me about? To tell me you're staying out of it? You got it, sweetheart. I know your type. You come around, you stir up trouble, and before you know it, I've got all my monkeys wanting a war in the Emerald City. Thanks, but no thanks. You're lucky I let you come here at all. Um, obviously, I hadn't come here trying to get the monkeys to go to war. Come to think of it, I hadn't even asked to be brought here at all. Really, all I wanted in the world was a nap. A really, really, really long nap. And a shower. And maybe some ice cream and some bad TV. Even so, Queen Lulu's attitude was seriously pissing me off. Without really meaning to, I placed my hands indignantly on my hip. Seriously? How can you act like that what Dorothy does isn't your problem? You may be hidden up here for now, but she'll burn this place to the ground as soon as she gets around to it. Wouldn't you rather live somewhere where you don't have to hide? Where you don't have to cut off your wings? Lulu picked up a banana from a bunch that was sitting on a table by her throne and peeled it. Royalty or not, she chewed with her mouth open. Come on, she snorted. We monkeys have had the short end of the hot dog for as long as Oz has been Oz. I may be the boss lady now, but in my day I've hauled more than one witch around like I was a common chauffeur. Dorothy, the wizard, Mombi, and her stupid little order. They're all the same to me. The order wants freedom for everyone.